If you've been paying attention to the news recently, you may have noticed that many of the big stories revolve around questions of race. Increasingly in this country, race is the headline. Just this week, Roseanne Barr was fired and her show was canceled on ABC after she tweeted an attack on Valerie Jarrett that many described as racist. Starbucks, the coffee retailer, closed more than 8,000 of its retail stores in order to re-educate its white employees about their unconscious racism. Meanwhile, a bar in Portland, Oregon, hosted a reparations happy hour where non-white patrons drank for free. Over in cable newsland, MSNBC aired an hour-long primetime special that not only attacked racism, but also engaged in it by stereotyping an entire group of people based on their skin color. Here's a selection from that. The gentrifiers of today, their parents or their grandparents, ran away from the city to get away from black and brown folk. And now their children and their grandchildren are saying, oh, the suburbs, there's only so many olive gardens I can go to, so I need to go back to the city and get my life in the city. But when I do that, I need to have my hot yoga studio and my pottery studio and my stuff represented. And if you intrude on that, I will then call the police. Well, more and more, it feels like racial division is the subtext of virtually everything in this country. Even topics that seem unrelated to ethnicity suddenly are racially fraught. The effect of all that is a deeply angry and divided nation, but also, you may have noticed, a terrified one. Many Americans are scared to say what they really think about just about anything. One false word and you could be denounced on Twitter and lose your livelihood. It happens. We see it all the time. Best just to smile and nod and hope the witch hunt passes. How long do we have to live this way? And how did we get here in the first place? Joining us now is someone who has paid attention closely for a long time, Peter Kersenow, a lawyer who serves on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights and has written a new thriller called Second Strike, which I can tell you firsthand is excellent. Peter, thanks a lot for joining us. Always my pleasure, Tucker. So there's something strange going on. Even as the country becomes much more diverse, and that was a trend that we were promised would make the country more harmonious, the country seems much more on edge about questions of race. What is going on? Well, I think uh, several things are going on, but the overriding thing is a political narrative that's driven to enhance one argument or the side of one particular side. And it has its genesis in two things. First is the political imperative of getting Democrats elected chiefly. Yes. And so we have a lot of this division on the basis of race because there are no policy prescriptions anymore. If you've listened very closely, you don't hear any workable policy prescriptions or very few workable policy prescriptions. But what you hear a lot of is identity politics. I've been on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 17 years. And in that 17 years, we haven't had more lucid conversations about race or identity. They have gotten increasingly sophomoric. They've gotten increasingly opaque. And they're driven by an ahistorical narrative, one that doesn't have or very little bearing on what truly happened in the United States of America. Look, the fact of the matter is that in my lifetime, matters of race and racial discriminations have gotten demonstrably better in ways that we could never even imagine. If you look at the interaction between individuals of various races today, they've never been better, individuals of races. But when you come to right. the interaction between groups, it's become hostile and toxic, and it's a function of trying to get certain groups to have an allegiance to a certain movement or a certain party for a political imperative. Since may, may, may I stop you there and just get back up for a second to address something that you said that I'd never thought of? The conversation is increasingly general and less specific. So whereas 30 years ago, people might say in order to close the achievement gap in standardized testing, we need to put more money into Head Start, for example. Now the conversation is this group is bad. It has always been bad. It will never get better. Why are we hearing fewer solutions than we used to hear? Well, I think for a couple of reasons. One, again, is that political imperative because solutions augur against having a, a political advantage. But I think it's also because there's a, a tendency on the part of some to shout down others, to cast others as the other. And again, that's for political imperative. But you're right. afraid to say things that are demonstrably true. To give you one example, a couple of weeks ago, we had a hearing at the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, all-day hearing, people from the Justice Department, Police Chiefs Association, you name it. Everybody in the world was there, and the usual groups were there. 
Uh, it was a hearing on hate crimes because of the ostensible spike in hate crimes since Trump has been elected. Um, but facts are stubborn things. And when you take a look at the data, and when I ask questions of this, after everyone made these grand pronouncements about how horrible and horrific the spike in hate crimes is, we had no hard evidence of such spike. And the best data on this comes from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, which has shown for, for the last 30 years there has been a decline in hate crimes. There's been a decline in all manner of discrimination for more than 30 years. Yet we have greater sensitivity, heightened sensitivity, and you have to ask yourself this: I, I, why this is, this is the case. And I think to some extent it's because it helps the agenda of certain groups, of certain parties, of certain individuals. So you keep hearing that we need to have an honest conversation on race, and I'm always for conversations, particularly for honest ones. But I wonder, after all these conversations, if the country is becoming more divided, maybe that's not evidence that it's not working. Do we need to talk less about race or more about race? Does the conversation idea hold up to scrutiny? Two things. One is, Tucker, I disagree that we're having conversations. We always hear that we need to have a conversation, but what we get is harangues, and the harangues usually come from one side, right. and most decent people kind of duck their heads and watch out for incoming fire. They don't want to get caught in the crossfire, and you know if you go to colleges, law schools, almost any institution of higher learning, and frankly, K through 12, there are only certain acceptable opinions that you can have. There are students who are punished, and they know this, and they know precisely how to react in the, the right. context of a, a classroom debate ostensibly on race. There's only one acceptable opinion, and you're not right. allowed to offer other opinions, and that doesn't forward the conversation. And one other point. No, and it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help anybody. I can see why they try to shout you down, <laughs> by the way, but I'm glad that you came. Thanks very much. Peter Kersnow, great to see you.